Well, first of all, Charles, thank you so much for um, giving me this honor and um, great joy to uh, have you here in um, Tallinn and okay. also later on in Helsinki. So uh, once again, welcome and thanks for um, doing that. Well, you're more than welcome. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. Thanks. Uh, can you please um, enlighten us a little bit about your background in becoming Strength Sensei? Well, what happened is that I was in the weight room at the university and I was training and um, a national team guy said, hey, you're pretty strong, can you write me a program? And I was only 17 years old. Wow. He was in his 20s and I wrote him a program and then he became the world's best volleyball player and he qualified for the Olympic Games and it, that's how it started. It started with one athlete and then it moved on from there. So where did the name Strength Sensei come from? Because I, I come from a martial arts background and right. when I left my former company I needed a new branding. I didn't like to use the word strength guru. They gave me that name for muscle media years ago but I decided that Sensei, the true term means teacher. So mm -hmm. the, the teacher of strength. and. A lot of people who do weight training, I've done martial arts, so I figured out the branding would be rather fast. Mm. Cool. Um, since you were saying that it all started with one guy who became famous, mm. uh, can you possibly name drop some, uh, some of your famous clients' names? Well, probably the client I'm most proud of is Adam Nelson, who's an Olympic gold medalist in shot put. Obviously, the average person doesn't know who he is, but in the track and field community, he's the man who's won the most medals in shot put. Another guy would be Dwight Phillips, who's world and Olympic champion in long jump. But uh, I've uh, worked with actors like Bruno Gunn from uh, Hunger Games. So I've worked with a lot of different people, but um, that's the, the two athletes I'm most proud of. Nice. Uh, talking about being proud, what do you think a good personal trainer should be proud of? What is a good example of a personal trainer? What kind of ethics and traits should be there? Success breeds success. So a good personal trainer should have results. So today in my lecture I said a uh, good personal trainer slash strength coach should get a woman, regardless of body fat or age, to be able to do 12 chin-ups in 12 weeks. So if you wanted a job with me, you would have to show me videos of women being able to do 12 chin-ups and then it can be done in 12 weeks not seven years so that would be the a good test are there any other traits good personal trainers are observant and they're fine psychologists in other words not everybody responds to the same uh, cues some people like to be insulted and that, that it gets them moving some people like to be praised but I don't like to use praise and giving people qualities. I give people reinforcement for working hard. So I will say to a person, you're making progress in your chin-up because you worked hard at it, not because you're gifted for chin-ups or you're smarter or stronger than the average person. I always reward hard work. If you reward hard work, people will do more hard work for you. But if you give them a, a quality or you're strong, they won't push themselves because they don't want to disappoint you. So, um, talking about pushing hard, what could be the secrets behind getting big and strong and fast? There's three success principles for getting big and strong. Number one, hard work. Number two, hard work. <laughs> Number three, more hard work. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, in essence, the winners outwork everybody. Doesn't mean you have to work stupid, Smart work that works everybody. Yeah. Perfect. Um, smart work and hard work. Is there any perfect training system? No. The best. The problem with training is that no matter how good it is, well designed, <coughs> you will adapt to it. So if you're a great coach, you can predict adaptation and you change at the right time. You never change when you, once you've hit plateau, you change right before you hit plateau, and that's the key to being a great coach. So that's pretty much all about individualization as well. Right? Correct, so some people are like rhinoceros, some people are leopards, some people are giraffes. So, you know, we're basically animals, but some people react to more speed work, some people react to slow work, so people don't like change, so you gotta change it 
just enough so that you induce progress, but not enough to create anxiety. So psychology is a, is a big part of it. Um, is psychology also the main factor while you train bodybuilders versus um, strengths or in uh, any other um, competitive um, athletes? I wouldn't say so. It, psychology applies to everybody all the time. So, But powerlifters, for example, will be obsessed with strength while bodybuilders will be obsessed with their physiques. So the, the I mean, most bodybuilders, if you told them that horse shit would make them stronger or bigger, <laughs> they would seek out the next horse farm. You know? <laughs> so they, they will do whatever it takes to get bigger. So, but powerlifter is the same if you say, you need to eat inside of a turtle uh, <laughs> to, to get a bigger squat, they'll seek the Galapagos Islands, you know, mm -hmm. so um, you, the thing that I found over the years is that the best athletes are never satisfied. So it's what we call in psychology the growth mindset. They always want to do that extra centimeter, the whatever it needs to be better. So uh, high, all high performance people whether it's in business or bodybuilding, they they just want more. Mm. Is there a place for visualization for um, um, becoming better? Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, I've coached Olympic medalists in 17 different sports. What I have found is that we know from research is that our best athletes are actually the best visualizers. The difference between a great visualizer and an average one is that the great can see it like a, they see it on TV, but they also they can see it with their own eyes. In other words, the, our best skiers could, uh, if you give them a stopwatch and you say, I want you to imagine the race you had in Kitzbühel, close your eyes, start the clock when you get off the gates, stop your stopwatch when you finish the gate. The difference in time is only 0.1 seconds. So they can go through every curve you know, in their mind and pick it up. Now, um, to finish it off, I have kind of um interesting question yeah. because there's always been debates about um, your methods yeah. there are people who are totally against them mm -hmm. there are people who are totally for it mm -hmm. so what would be your final words for those who are talking uh, not with you I don't run a cult <laughs> so and you know I come from America and in America it's a land of free speech mm -hmm. so actually you learn from people who don't agree with you so either you learn to debate your point better or you change your mind. So uh, it's never bothered me. Uh, in the end is who has the most results. So my hardest enemies have had no results to back up their claims. So I'll debate, for example, with John Bros on squatting frequency. He has very good results. So it's a friendly, intelligent debate. But if somebody says this exercise is the king of exercise, I'll say, well, tell me who used it and did better than me. So, at the but the important thing in life is you have to learn from everybody you meet. And sometimes someone who disagrees with you, what you learn from them is that you're actually right. So, it, it, it serves a purpose. Perfect. Okay. Well, Charles, thank you so much because from you we've certainly learned uh, quite a lot of things and I really appreciate your time here. You're welcome, Celia. <laughs>